I can vividly remember when I was 13 years old and my parents took me to the local movie theater to see the latest Batman movie, which was Batman and Robin, all the way back in 1997. And before my eyes, I saw the once great and powerful Batman film series crumble away. What started off as a dark and psychological direction from Tim Burton had descended into something that just looked and felt, well, for lack of a better word, really toddlerish. And it seems that I wasn't the only one, as not only is Batman and Robin considered one of the worst superhero movies of all time, but one of the worst movies of all time in general. Anyway, as we sat there in the movie theater, the film ended, and I'm not kidding. As the credits rolled, my mum said, Oh, I quite like that. I loved all the bright, flashy lights and colors. She further said that Batman and Robin looked pretty and magical. And even recently in conversation, I brought up Batman and Robin, and she said, Oh, is that the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah, I really like that one. So why am I telling you this? Well, because it's easy to pick on Batman and Robin. Nearly every YouTuber and their pet parrot has gone on about the bat nipples, the bat credit card, and all those terrible ice puns. But after thinking about my mum's generally positive reaction to the movie, today I'm going to constructively look into 10 things that you didn't know about Batman and Robin to try and figure out why the movie turned out the way that it did. You know, not just pick on the movie because that's the easy and popular thing to do, but to try and piece together the pieces to learn how this bizarre movie came to be. So, let's check it out. Belt, not a money belt, six million. Seven million. <laughs> Never leave the cave without it. Number 10, Batman Forever put Batman and Robin into a fast production. After Batman Returns scared McDonald's with its violence and green penguin vomit, no one really believed in the Batman franchise anymore. Yes, Batman Forever still went into production, but it was felt that the movie wouldn't be big business. But lo and behold, in 1995, Batman Forever brought in the Bat Dollars, bringing in over $336 million at the box office. Suddenly, Batman was cool and hip again. Delighted with this unexpected success, Warner Brothers put the next Batman movie, Batman and Robin, into production without any passing of time, in order for the movie to be made as soon as possible, so Batman and Robin can ride off the success of Batman Forever. With the previous three movies, there had been a three-year gap in between films. With the release of Batman and Robin, there was only going to be two. And Batman Forever's director, Joel Schumacher, and writer, Akiva Goldsman, were pretty much drafted to get to work on the next Batman movie to make it as soon as possible. And I do think that's a mistake, as I believe with movies like Batman, it is a good idea to have more of a break in between movies in order to avoid overkill and to let the powers that be behind the movies recharge their creative batteries, so to speak. In many ways, I do think that Batman and Robin is the burnout that came after Batman Forever. Number nine, the fast-tracked production led to the departure of Val Kilmer. Or did it? Whether you like Val Kilmer in the role of Batman in Batman Forever or not, one thing you have to admit, he did have a tough job filling in the bat boots after the legendary Michael Keaton. However, due to Batman and Robin being put through a speedy production, Kilmer couldn't commit to returning as the Dark Knight due to filming commitments on the movie V adaptation of The Saint. However, I don't think there was much love lost between Kilmer and Batman and Robin's director, Joel Schumacher as it's kind of become legend that the two really didn't get along during the making of Batman Forever. Schumacher said that Kilmer kind of quit, but he also kind of got fired too, and further stated that Kilmer actually didn't return as Batman as he wanted to work on the movie version of The Island of Dr. Moreau, just so he can work with Marlon Brando. And well, we all know how that film turned out. 
So did Kilmer leave on his own accord, or was there at least some kind of pokes and prods to remove the actor? Well, we may never know the entire story. Number 8. The Search for a New Batman Having starred as Dick Grayson and Robin in Batman Forever, actor Chris O'Donnell was set in stone to return as Robin, whose appearance this time round was more resembling the Nightwing character that Dick Grayson would become in the Teen Titan comics. However, the production needed a new Bruce Wayne and Batman. Joel Schumacher's number one choice was William Baldwin, whom he had previously worked with on Flatliners. And yes, I can kind of see that happening, and he definitely does have the right look. Apparently, David Duchovny was also considered, who was popular at that time thanks to the X-Files TV series. However, George Clooney was also a big star at that time thanks to the medical drama ER, so he was cast instead. In fact, Clooney was filming ER simultaneously while filming Batman and Robin, pretty much filming ER during the day and Batman at night. It's been pointed out by nearly everyone that Clooney's portrayal of Batman was a far cry from the conflicted and tragic soul that we had seen in the previous movies, where Clooney pretty much plays the part as, well, Clooney. But that's not necessarily his fault, as Schumacher wanted a lighter interpretation of Batman. I think in general, Schumacher wanted a Batman movie that was more in tone with the 1960s TV Batman. And with George Clooney, you've got a Bruce Wayne which is more in line with the Adam West portrayal as opposed to Keaton and Kilmer. Number 7 and the rest of the Batcast so when it came to casting the icy cold villain Mr. Freeze, several big names were considered, including Ed Harris, Patrick Stewart, and Anthony Hopkins, all of whom would have been amazing if the character was done right, especially Patrick Stewart. However, at the time, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the biggest star in the world, and the studio really wanted him in the role. According to Schwarzenegger, he turned them down a couple of times, until he gave in once they said to him that they can't make the movie without him. Yeah, I'm sure it had nothing to do with the $25 million fee that he got for starring in the movie. Joel Schumacher had wanted to work with Uma Thurman ever since seeing her as Venus in The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, and so she was offered to play Poison Ivy. However, like Schwarzenegger, she originally turned the movie down. Other actresses considered for the part include Sharon Stone, Demi Moore, and Julia Roberts. However, when Thurman learned that the Poison Ivy character is a villainess, she changed her mind and was cast. Alicia Silverstone was the first and only choice for Batgirl, as around that time she starred in the teen comedy Clueless, and so it was probably felt that she would bring in a teenage market. The irony being, the Batgirl character was also introduced to the 60s TV series in order to boost audience numbers after declining views, and Australian model Elle McPherson was cast as Bruce Wayne's girlfriend, Julie Madison, who is actually a character from the comics. In fact, she was Batman's very first love interest, but she is barely in the movie. In Batman and Robin, we don't know who she is, where she comes from, or why Bruce is with her. She just sort of shows up every now and then and halfway through the movie completely disappears from the film. I can actually remember reading a magazine article when the movie came out, which stated that most of her scenes were cut, as McPherson's acting just wasn't very good. But don't quote me on that. Either way, we're left with an important character we don't know anything about who just shows up here and there and probably only has a total of five minutes screen time. Number six, Batman and Robin borrows story elements from the animated TV series and completely destroys them. When Joel Schumacher and Akiva Goldsman started working on the story of Batman and Robin, they were still working on the crime thriller, A Time to Kill, of which might have gotten in the way of the creative process of Batman and Robin. However, they decided early on that they wanted to focus on the tragic love story angle of the Mr. Freeze character that was seen in the Batman animated series in the episode Heart of Ice. You see, originally the character of Mr. Freeze was called Mr. Zero, and made his debut in the comics in 1959, and the character was basically just a bank robber who uses a freezing gun to commit his robberies. That was until the 1992 episode of the Batman animated series, where Mr. Freeze is given a new backstory, 
where it's explained that he suffers a body temperature injury that he received while trying to freeze his wife who has a terminal illness, whom he was freezing so he can find a cure for her illness. And after the accident, he is stuck in his icy body armor protection, making the character more tragic and sympathetic rather than just being a crook with funky orange eyebrows. So naturally, this was the Mr. Freeze template for Batman and Robin. So what went wrong? Well, to be honest, the casting of Arnold Schwarzenegger, as the script had to be changed to accommodate for Schwarzenegger, who was an action star known for his puns, where we now have a character spurting out ice puns. Lots and lots of ice puns. Allow me to break the ice. A freeze is coming. Freeze well. What killed the dinosaurs? The ice age. All right, everyone. Chill. It's a cold town. Cool party. <laughs> and chill to perfection. Let's kick some ice. It's weird because on the one hand, you've got this tragic character who is trying to save his sick wife. But on the other hand, he's Arnold Schwarzenegger constantly saying ice puns. I think it would have helped if they had just made Arnie's Mr. Freeze a cheesy one-liner spewing bank robber, like how we saw in the 60s TV show. However, oddly, the botching of Mr. Freeze was nothing compared to Bane. In the comics, Bane is a terrifying force to be reckoned with. He represents the dark and terrifying fate and judgment of Batman. In fact, this is the villain who broke Batman. In Batman and Robin, he's just a growling buffoon. They pretty much reduce Bane to being non from Superman 2. Or worse yet, Nuclear Man. And to my knowledge, he hardly shares any screen time with Batman. It's also worth pointing out though that the character was played by a wrestler called Robert Swenson, who sadly passed away just two months after the release of Batman and Robin. It's like the powers that be didn't know anything about the Bane character and just added him because he was a new villain at that time and was popular in the comics. A very similar thing would actually happen 10 years later in Spider-Man 3 with the Venom character. And in both cases, the characters would eventually be saved by Tom Hardy. Number five, toys, toys, and more toys. One thing that stands out to me in regards to Batman and Robin is, well, just how toddlerish it looks as mentioned. Remember that dark and creepy world that Tim Burton had created in the first Batman movies and how they mixed 1940s noir with a gothic, almost futuristic industrial setting? Well, by the time you get to Batman and Robin, the Batman cinematic world now looks like a bright and colorful toy commercial for kids. And well, that's exactly because that's what it is. By Joel Schumacher's own admission, during the production of Batman and Robin, toy companies pretty much took over and would get involved and make sure that everything looked, quote, toyetic. Because at the end of the day, it was all about selling action figures. So everything from the Batmobile and other vehicles to the costumes had to look like toys and something that kids would buy and play with. And I think this is a terrible shame and part of Batman and Robin's many problems. The love of selling toys and marketing took over and got in the way of the love of creativity. The funny thing is, the Superman the Movie DVD featurette taught me the word verisimilitude, where Richard Donner explains that it means maintaining a sense of realism no matter how ridiculous the plot is. Whereas the Batman and Robin DVD featurette taught me the word toyetic. Which basically means to hell with all that, we need to sell toys. Number four, Batgirl's costume was changed at the last minute. Despite being her debut big screen appearance, Barbara, AKA Batgirl, doesn't have much screen time in the movie. She shows up every now and then until finally at the end, she becomes Batgirl without any training, mind you. There was meant to be more scenes involving Batgirl, but they weren't filmed as well into the movie's shoot, Batgirl's costume had changed from having a full cowl like Batman to just having a smaller eye mask like Robin. This was supposedly done to showcase Alicia Silverstone more. Personally, I think they should have just stuck with the cowl, as that is the character's original look. And you do briefly see it for five seconds in the movie. At the time of filming, word got out that there was issues with the Batgirl costume, where the press quite cruelly put it down to Alicia Silverstone putting on weight, of which Joel Schumacher flat out denied. But regardless, because of the costume change, many of Batgirl's scenes were vetoed from the film, 
However, the Batgirl costume would go on to be reused in a short-lived Birds of Prey series in 2002, be that a repainted version of the costume with minor modifications. Like the other characters in Batman and Robin, Batgirl was severely botched, as originally Barbara is Commissioner Gordon's daughter. But in Batman and Robin, for some reason, they make her Alfred Pennyworth's niece? I don't get it. Number three, the trials and dilemmas of being Mr. Freeze. So yet again, we're talking about Mr. Freeze. Well, that suit was anything but a joy to work with, on the account of how difficult it was to move around in it and just how heavy it was. In fact, there are several stories out there that Arnie only really played Mr. Freeze in the close-ups, and the rest of the footage, particularly Mr. Freeze in movement, or when we see him in full body, was all a stunt double. Chris O'Donnell said that despite seeing Schwarzenegger on the set, he didn't actually film a scene with the Hollywood tough guy. So it kind of makes a fun game when watching the Mr. Freeze scenes in Batman and Robin to try and spot out if it's actually Arnie or not. However, Arnie still did have to undergo the makeup process, as well as wear part of the suit for his close-up scenes, of which was a six hour long process. Arnie also had to put lead lights in his mouth in order to make his teeth light up. But this was quite dangerous, as it would often result in battery acid leaking out of them. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I would imagine that a mouth full of battery acid can't be a good thing. Arnie would often complain when the lights would leak by yelling out, they taste like shit. Very appropriate response when you think about it. Interestingly, Batman and Robin isn't the only Batman movie to feature Arnie, where if you look in the background of Max Shrek's office in Batman Returns, you can see a photo of Shrek with a younger Arnie. But I guess within the film series universe, you could say it's Max Shrek with a young Victor Freeze. Number two, death of a genre. At the time of Batman and Robin's release, there was a lot of buzz and anticipation, especially after Batman Forever. People were really excited for this Bat entry. The movie was released in June 1997 and made $238 million on a $160 million budget, bringing in nearly $100 million less than Batman Forever did. Batman and Robin had a strong start at the box office, but its figures were rapidly dropping within its second week of being released, probably due to word of mouth and negative backlash as to how bad the movie was. Batman and Robin also couldn't compete with other movies that came out at that time, such as Disney's Hercules, Face Off, and of course Men in Black. The reception from both critics and fans were abysmal. Some critics labeling the movie as unbearable and mindless, and it currently only has 11% on Rotten Tomatoes. The failures of Batman and Robin not only killed the current Batman film series, but also the superhero genre in general. You have to remember that this was a time when there wasn't a superhero movie being released every 10 minutes, but in fact every couple of years. And when they failed, they hit hard. It's believed that the reception of Batman and Robin was part of the reason that Tim Burton's Superman Lives movie was scrapped, as well as a Spider-Man movie that James Cameron was working on. And Batman and Robin, along with other failures like Sphere, The Avengers, and Wild Wild West, caused great financial issues for Warner Brothers, leading to the cancellation of other projects like the Hawaiian Beetlejuice sequel. All I have to say is lucky for them, they had the Matrix around the corner to fix everything up. And so, from day one, Batman and Robin were seen as something as a huge failure in the superhero movie genre, and temporarily killed it. And it was only with the release of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movie several years later that got the superhero movie genre back into the popular zeitgeist. Number one, could Batman have been triumphant? Joel Schumacher apparently could see that with Batman and Robin, the Batman movies had gone down a silly and childish direction, and had planned to direct a fifth Batman movie called Batman Triumphant. And this was to be his redemption for Batman and Robin. It was to take the series down a much darker direction, and it was to also feature the villain Scarecrow. I can actually remember reading an article on a Batman website in the late 90s, and it claimed that Jeff Goldblum was in talks to play the Scarecrow, and Madonna may appear as Harley Quinn, who wants revenge over the Joker's death, and that Jack Nicholson himself was to return as the Joker, in the form of a hallucination who comes back to taunt Batman after the Scarecrow uses his fear gas on him. 
Now, I don't know how much of this is true and how much of this is bat BS. But one thing is for sure, the poor reception of Batman and Robin put a stop to the current Batman series and Batman Triumphant was canned. Schumacher wanted to then focus on a film version of Batman Year One, but he ended up leaving the project. And the Year One project eventually evolved into the rebooted Christopher Nolan Dark Knight trilogy. The big question is, could Batman Triumphant have saved the current Batman film series, or had the goose been cooked thanks to Batman and Robin? The famous negativity surrounding Batman and Robin actually caused Joel Schumacher to somewhat surrender in defeat in the DVD special feature and actually apologized for directing Batman and Robin and that it was only his intention to entertain people, not to offend them. If I, if I disappointed them in any way, then I really want to apologize because it wasn't my intention. My intention was just to entertain them. This is a very unique thing to happen and raises so many questions. Like, should directors apologize for bad films more often? And should they be held accountable for making bad films? In my opinion, no. Movies are art, and art just is. Whether it's good or not depends on the observer and how it's perceived. But at the end of the day, it is still just a piece of art. Don't get me wrong, Batman and Robin is a bad movie in my opinion, but I think a lot of that is sheer misguidedness. It was misguided to make it a toy advert. It was misguided to go for a more light-hearted, comical, campy tone. It was misguided to force the movie into a quick production. But regardless, despite all its flaws, it was made with the best of intentions. We as the viewers have the right to not like the movie, but it was still just a piece of popcorn fun that Joel Schumacher tried to entertain us with. Bat nipples and all. I can actually remember in the same week in 1997, I saw both Batman and Robin and The Lost World Jurassic Park. Yeah, not a good week in my childhood. The best way to enjoy Batman and Robin is to sit down, watch it with a few beers and a few mates, and just watch it with the intention of knowing that it's a bad movie, so let's just enjoy how bad the movie is. Anyway, I'm Minty, and all said and done, my mum is kind of right. Batman and Robin is a pretty movie and looks great, so I guess there's that. See ya! Thank <laughs> you.